Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the virtual breakfast sessions. I'm Larry Sashin. Today, we're starting something brand new for you. It is the Produce Pulse with Julio Garcia from Produce Experience, and uh, I think it's going to be a great show. So before we start going on this, Julio, why don't you tell us who you are and what you do? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Julio Garcia. First off, I want to thank uh, Larry and Fred uh, for the opportunity to um, ramble on for the next half hour, 40 minutes uh, about produce and the restaurant industry. Um, I am a lifelong produce guy. I've done everything from buying to selling to I've sold internationally. I've driven trucks. I think I drove a tractor trailer at 15 before I was allowed to drive a car. So, um, yeah, I've been in it for, I can just say, my entire life. My dad owned a store in the old Bronx Terminal Market back in the 60s before I was born. And, uh, yeah, we uh, we closed that place up in 96. And ever since, I've been on my own at a bunch of different uh, places. This is a great opportunity for me here at Produce Experience. It is a, uh, a group of produce veterans. And um, I do the business development for for them and for two other companies that are that we're connected uh, we are sqf certified growers shippers packers distributors so we um we cover the gamut as far as food safety goes on the produce side we specialize in um, aromatic herbs from uh, all over hawaii central america south america um, the middle east and we also do tropical produce where we have growing partnerships. We have our own packing facilities in Ecuador. Uh, we just partnered up with a pretty big shipper out of Costa Rica. And um, like I said, I've done everything from retail to food service to restaurants, you name it. So um, that's me in a, in a, in a few sentences there. Okay. So besides asking you how that makes you an expert uh, let's move on to um, you know, we have a situation where we're dealing with restaurants with $65 steaks, with $25 hamburgers and $28 chicken. Um, it's, there, you know, there's an obvious and a subtle reason why it's the time for produce. Julio, why produce now? More than ever, I think coming out of the pandemic, it's important to understand that um, still, for many years, food cost has been the number one uh, issue with restaurants, They're one of their biggest concerns. So obviously, the meat industry has, for lack of a better word, become more streamlined. Where there used to be thousands of meat suppliers, there are tens of meat suppliers. So they, they kind of have a, and the demand for meat worldwide has really increased. So having those $65 steaks, 65 is actually cheap for a T-bone. I don't know where you go out to eat, but, you know, if it, you know, you get the $30 hamburger and the $60 chicken meal. I see a lot of restaurants just going market price on everything, which is crazy. I, I, but produce, it's more important now than ever, just because restaurants are rebounding. And I think that the more inventive that you get, the more produce that you put out there, produce is still reasonable. Produce is still healthy. I think we're on a health kick. We're also probably being driven by the millennials. The millennials are, they have the certain amount of disposable income that they like to spend at restaurants. So it's important for us to follow their trends. And their trends, believe it or not, is healthy. You know, my daughter is right on the border of being a millennial. And all her life, she was, oh, anytime you ask that girl what she wanted to eat, she would always say something healthy and something healthy is something that we know what eating too much meat does to you. And you, we know what, um, you know, there are, let's say steroids or whatever in meat and produce for the most part, specifically organic produce, which is very trendy as well and keeps growing in, uh, in, in popularity produces. It's, I think it's a savior for many restaurants. I think a lot of restaurants can, you know, everybody knows the cauliflower craze. Did that have to do with all the, the, you know, flour being so expensive and we started to find alternative ways? Is it because of health? Are people 
more concerned about eating uh, cauliflower because it's gluten free. Um, my daughter has celiac disease, so you know she's been eating she's been eating roots and tubers, you know, from her Cuban father cook for her whole life, and you know they're gluten free, they're readily available, they're affordable, they're delicious. I, I, let me just ask you a question here, because we're we we nobody is disputing the health uh, of the, the health factors of of produce, and but today when you go to most restaurants, uh, look around the room here, you're in a room of boomers. You're in a room of boomers. Uh, to us, vegetables are a baked potato, a baked potato, French fries, and no. overcooked beans. I heard, Peter, I heard you. What about I'm that sorry. little piece of <laughs> What about that little piece of parsley they put at the end of the plate? Is that a yeah, vegetable? That's, your, yeah. greens. that's, your, that's greens. your greens. That's your so greens. So we had a groan. We had a groan from a restaurant tour. <laughs> and all right, Peter. So you are the man that looks at at the uh, at what's coming back on trays. Tell me that your vegetables aren't the most thrown away thing. On a plate. I, I good morning, everyone. I am so sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not, Larry. I'm not going to. The traditional vegetable, yes, it comes back on a regular basis. It's on buffets. Remember, a lot of our work is done on buffets on catering jobs. Um, but I, 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 I agree that the the new vegetables being used in so many different ways our number one appetizer in the restaurant now please don't shoot me for this is the brussels sprouts and it's it. tossed in with apples and a little bit of bacon we just did the food cost it's the cheapest appetizer we have at 14 dollars at a 24 percent um food cost a little bit of labor in there they take a little tlc but I, I think our generation, everybody's listening. There's new vegetables out there. It, it's And new vegetables, new beans, new pizzas. So I, I do agree with you that the higher med vegetable medley is coming back. I mean, is not being eaten because it's boring compared to everything else. Okay, okay. So, Julio, pick up on that. Well, <laughs> it's funny you would say Brussels sprouts because I – really know how to make Brussels sprouts and and I hate them. I that's something I can't get out. My mother used to, you know, in Spanish they're just called baby cabbage, you know, and I hated cabbage too. So Brussels sprouts, but I have to agree, Brussels sprouts are something that became very popular not too long ago. And again, once we started changing the growing region, which is part of what we do at Produce Experience, right? Um freight rates from California ten twelve thousand dollars freight rates from the border right from mccallan texas five thousand dollars so everybody started growing brussels sprouts in mexico and all of a sudden there was this abundance of it and credit to the um credit to the restaurant industry and the people who the movers and shakers and that that they found <laughs> they found a delicious way you know by adding apples and adding a little bit of bacon or shallots some people add maple syrup to it, and it really is great. It, we're in that lane. You know, I don't want you guys to think that we don't do any kind of conventional produce. We have a carrot deal right now in Mexico that we can keep carrots, 50-pound carrots, for less than 25 cents a pound on the wholesale and all year. Um, those are the kind of deals that are be ma being made in Mexico. Things that are coming back um, – all your baby vegetables, right? Your French beans, your baby carrots, your snow peas, snap peas, all this comes out of Guatemala. So it doesn't hurt to learn, you know, to know how to speak Spanish, trust me, in this industry. And and I've been and I've seen okra plantations in, in Honduras. Just because these things are now more readily available and cheaper, just because of the supply chain is helping the restaurant lower their food costs. So what I'm sure a guy like Peter is going to agree with me here. We do a lot. Of, we grow our own uh, aromatic herbs. It's amazing the growth 
in that industry, I mean, we cannot, we go through 10,000 kilos of basil in a week from four different sources. We go through an incredible amount of mint. Like you start realizing how you don't have to make a plate, you know, a, a, a baker size Idaho potato, right? And stuff it with cheese. And you can make a medley of vegetables. You can dress it up with some nice aromatic herbs. And guess what? It's delicious. It's cost effective. And I think that's the trend moving forward is not necessarily volume. You know, like everybody likes to, I don't, in the restaurant industry, I know a lot of people that'll tell you, we don't want people walking out the door with doggy bags. You know, if we, if a guy walked out with a meal for tomorrow or the next day, really, really, I don't think the restaurant did his job. I think if, look, I'm the kind of guy I like to go to a place. I like to eat everything they serve me. So I don't care to have a huge plate full of stuff as long as it's delicious. And I think that that's the challenge also for guys like Peter. Okay. So, so, you know, we've mentioned, we, we're, we're still talking traditional. We're still talking traditional. Let's get back to your wheelhouse here. What about the introduction of tropicals into it? Well, as I told you yesterday, I, I spearheaded a program in Central America and Costa Rica and every Burger King, I think as of May, April or May of 2024, will be serving yucca fries as an alternative to onion rings and to French fries. The great thing about yucca, people don't understand what yucca, cassava, manioc, it is a staple. It is the number four staple on the planet. You have rice, you have corn, you have flour, you know, wheat, and you have cassava, mostly because the entire continent of Africa eats cassava, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. But if you realize that cassava does not absorb oil, it rejects it. When you make a yucca fry, it stays crispier than any french fry you've ever eaten and it stays crispier longer so you don't have to have a guy in a kitchen 150 degrees over the the you know the the fryer all day long just making french fries you can make as many yucca fries as you think you're going to have for service set them aside get that guy doing something else again cost effectiveness plantains like i said i was telling larry before i went to a restaurant i love the fact that Everybody serves guacamole as an appetizer. You know, when you make plantain strips and you put the plantain strips around the guacamole, it looks better. I me, mean, I have a taste preference. Tortilla chips taste like nothing. <laughs> plantain chips actually have a flavor. I know guys that use taro chips. And again, when you look at what it costs you for a 50-pound bag, like I was telling Larry yesterday, we sell 30 pounds of yucca for 20 bucks. And... You have to pay about fifty dollar, about a dollar a pound, dollar ten a pound for potatoes right now. Specifically, ones that are for baking. You know, Idaho potatoes are through the roof. Um, again, it's a logistics thing. We get most of our potatoes from Idaho. Idaho, we have to train. We have to send them on rail cars. Rail cars have to go to dispatch stations. Then they get put on containers. Then they come down to us. All that costs money. You have maybe a twenty dollar cost in idaho on a 50 pound potato by the time it gets to the wholesaler let's say in hunts point it costs them 15 dollars more you know because of all the taking the stuff putting it on a train taking it off a train putting it in a container driving it down freight rates inland freight rates are very expensive railroad is very expensive ocean freight we almost have the wholesaler or the importer like we are we almost have the ocean freight company at our disposal because that ship is leaving, you know, the old thing, that ship is sailed, right? So they need to get 300, 400 containers on that ship. So they're giving us better and better contracts. We're paying the same from Costa Rica and Ecuador in 2024 that we were paying in 2014. You can't say the same thing about inland freight. So if a truck is charging $12,000 from Salinas, California, bringing Romaine to New York and he's getting 12 grand next month. He's not going to go down to 10. If he can still get 12, you know, we're going to, you know, gas prices have gone down, but freight rates have not gone down. And it's because let's face it. There are a lot of things on the road and why lower it? $2,000 when you can get away with it. So freight rates, they do vary. I'm not saying, you know, 
we're also inland freights or you know um, transcontinental freights are always um, like holiday specific. Whenever there are uh, Mother's Day, there are so many people hauling flowers up north that you can't find a truck. So it used to cost you three thousand dollars to get a truck of oranges, say from from Florida to New York. Now it costs you six thousand dollars just because they're hauling a lot of flowers up. When Christmas trees start coming from the West, it's the same thing. You start getting, you know, you're trying to truck onions from Oregon and those onions where they were costing you 8,500, now it's costing you closer to 12. So on the things that we grow in Central and South America, part of what our plan is, is we can control the cost, right? We can give out costs to our customers a month ahead of time. I mean, one of my favorite customers is Baldor. Baldor, you know, they know how to buy. They know what the trend is. They know how to forecast. And they have a ton that, you know, their supply chain is second to none, you know, and they know how to do it. They realize that it's cheaper. You can get a, a, a 30 day price on avocados, pineapples, plantains, bananas. I haven't mentioned one conventional item yet. If you start going into California greens, and you're trying to get a price for one month, it's not hard. It's not easy to find. If you if you look at, I mean, Peter can tell you what tomatoes have been doing. So we also have uh, weather issues, right? Florida is not even a player anymore almost in, in tomatoes. Nobody eats that kind of tomatoes. Why you see Canada green, you know, you see the Campari tomatoes and the great tomatoes. And the these are much more popular because they can control the cost. Right. They have these greenhouses in Canada up in the frozen tundra and they're growing grape tomatoes for you and they can control the cost all anytime a restaurant can fix his menu. If restaurants are not going to change their menu prices, you know, that that costs money. So they need uh, the restaurant needs fixed costs, fixed cost with tropical produce. If you integrate it into your restaurant, we can fix the cost for up to three months. So you're going to have four price changes in an entire year. We wow. give out contracts for a year on plantains. You know, we know, we forecast, we know what it's going to, we know how it's going to be. And and trust me, you know, there are more and more every year. We're up to 25 containers of plantains. That's almost 30,000 boxes a week. So the, they keep growing. Every year we go, we grow from four to 8% on the sale of tropicals. I went from, selling one container, 1,600 boxes of yucca, say two years ago, we're up to over 5,000. And our competitors are doing the same. No one is losing sales of tropicals. Tropicals are only increasing. Aromatic herbs are only getting more and more busy. Let me break in for a second, because in a, a past uh, VBS, Peter had mentioned that everything he brings into his restaurant has to be have multiple uses. So if Peter were to bring in yucca, besides fries, where does it go? Well, the, the traditional way of, look, in Africa, they make what's called fufu, right? And fufu, if you've ever watched, uh, you know, one of these shows where they have like a big drum and you see the lady with the stick mashing and she's making fufu. Fufu, if you take yucca and you mash it enough, let's face it, in Africa, there are not too many forks and knives and spoons and utensils. So they make this fufu, and it's very traditionally like, let's say, in Middle East, we'll eat, we'll, or the Ethiopians will grab a piece of bread or Indians, naan, and use that as a utensil to eat the meat or the vegetable. So fufu, I just was at an Ethiopian restaurant, and they served fufu, and it was actually, it was delicious, a little gummy, but that's a traditional way to do it in African cooking. In, in, his, you know, in Caribbean cooking, we just simply peel it, chunk it, boil it, and then we'll put, uh, you know, sautéed onions on it. And it's a great side dish for anything that's savory. You know, Caribbean uh, cuisine is that agri dolce, you know, that sweet and sour, salty. It hits every note, you know, and Caribbeans are known for, you know, our Creole sauces and tantalizing taste buds. That's, I mean, I'm a great home chef. I'm classically trained, but I'm a great home chef. I love grabbing guys like you, Larry, have them come over and have some ropa vieja and some tostones and some fried yuca and some, and it changes. My wife's got 70 year old cousins that I did a 
five minute YouTube video years ago on teaching them how to cook white yaltia. And she says, I walk into ShopRite every day. I see this thing. I don't know what the heck it is. Again, it's education. And I gave a five minute tutorial. Every time she cooks it, Carol Petrie, I love her to death. She sends me a text. She'll take a picture of the of the of the you know of the plate that I it's an alternative. How many mashed potatoes can you eat, Larry? You know, try it. It's look, the New York Times every three months puts out an article called Yucca is Potato 2.0. It, oh. It's it's got all the right carbs, it's got the right perfect fiber. It's you know what? It's different. It's just, you know, again, not that I'm an anti-potato guy, right? But my lane is tropical, so I'm going to push them. You know, if you've ever eaten taro chips, you know, uh, many, many years ago, you had that uh, the chip company. Uh, Terra teacher, Chips. Terra, Terra chip. Chips. And Terra Chips really was a game changer for us. I, I, mean, I don't know if I told you, we started a program in Honduras that went three years. That program, we sold about five or 6,000 bags, 40-pound bags of Malanga Coco into the U.S. That program put almost 70 ex-prostitutes, some teenagers, took them off the streets. We ran that program with the man who passed away last year who was an angel. And that's another thing that we do with the tropical industry is that we provide jobs for people in their countries, livable wages. I was spearheaded over 20 years ago, fair, fair trade. The fair trade, I used to walk into a banana field and see no bathrooms, no eyewashes, no first aid kits. All that has changed. And let's not forget, again, we talk about this, Larry, and we talk about this a lot. Avocados, pineapples, bananas, uh, mangoes, they were all tropical about 40 years ago, and no one knew who what they were. But somebody stepped up, and now all of a sudden, I eat, Larry eats more avocados probably than I do. You know? <laughs> yes. It, it, Hold on just a second, staples. Julio. Hold on a second. We got a question from the audience. Sherry? Yes. Hi. Good morning. Um, good morning. So good to meet you, Julio. So I come from, uh, originally come from the Philippines, and you, you talk about yucca and, and all that. And I think one of the problems sometimes is that people don't know how to use these uh, exotic vegetables and fruits, you know, in a more innovative way, or not even innovative, but really being more exploratory about the different cuisines of the world. For example, you know, cassava, yucca, and, you know, we, as you said, you know, we, we use it in, like in stews and, and, um, uh, use them, in, you know, brace them, et cetera. But the other thing is uh, in, in desserts. I mean, we have this di this dessert called halo halo, and you can find all different types of, you know, beans, you know, sweetened beans and, and you know, uh, yucca cut up, et cetera. So I think that's, that's maybe that's one thing that uh, the produce people can talk more about, about, you know, Asian uh, influences. And, and the other thing too, you were talking about, the audiences right now in colleges and universities, they are actually, some of them <clears throat> have uh, exclusive vegan and vegetarian halls. I'm, I'm actually right for Total Food Service and the upcoming article will be about George Mason University where they have a, uh, a place called The Spot where it's all vegetarian and vegan and they even have reg registered dietitians that help the students, you know, learn about the nutrition and also there's also cooking. So I think that's the other thing, Julia, that I don't know if when you partner with somebody, have different chefs that can talk about how to use yucca in Asian cuisine or, you know, in as you, you spoke about fufu in Ethiopia, there's also in Hawaii where they use something similar. So Boy. I think really broadening more, you know, and just not, I think the Caribbean is great, Mexican, et cetera. But it's a big, wide world out there, so... 100%. Yeah. Yes, yes. Thank you. Sherry, Fred, thank you, been... you, thank you for that question. That, that's a great question. And I, I, let me tell you, I make a mean chicken adobo, by the way. I make a mean chicken adobo. Uh, <laughs> she's absolutely right. I meant, you know, people don't know what taro root is. If you ever go to Hawaii, it's poi. 
It's what, and it's the national dish of Hawaii. So she's 100% right. There is a lot of crossover between Asians. Let's remember that Asians have traveled all through Central South America and the Caribbean. So the Asian influence in in all, worldwide is is undeniable. So yeah, that's awesome that you would bring that up because you know uh, not just yuca or yauti or malanga or plantains, yellow plantains. You know there is a lot of different. Like I said, we're using more opal basil than ever, more Thai basil than ever. Um, we use, you know, we we sell lemongrass. We sell, um, and it's the Asian influence also. The reason why people don't know how to cook it is, and I've always, I started going on Instagram and I would proclaim myself as the safe, self-proclaimed tropical produce advocate. And and you know what? I don't have the the chutzpah, you know, or the clout to, to get it to take that further. I hope this takes it another step further. But pro, tropical produce, Asian produce specifically needs advocates. That means we need to somehow raise money, use lobbyists. This is why I'm part of an association called the Produce Distributors Association, the PDA. And we are raising, we do have a lobbyist in Washington raising awareness, uh, things like school lunches, uh, things like hospital food. Uh, we're concerned about getting uh, our products, teaching people. I've always thought, you know, if you if you've ever watched um, you know, a cooking show on Food Network or whatever, they'll tinker with Asian products, you know, they'll all tinker with it or they'll, but no one truly advocates it. You do have some, some Latin and you do have some Asian chefs that just by being in, in, on mainstream TV, you know, or mainstream media, people are learning more about these items. It is a slow growth. We definitely have a lot more work to do, but let's face it, what with what the price of real estate is in this country, I remember being a kid going down to Homestead, Florida, and it was all farms, tomato farms, avocado farms, all this. You go to Homestead, Florida, it's, it's all condos and townhouses and, you know, all the, it's become ridiculously expensive to grow in California or to grow all up and down the, the West Coast. You know, the apple industry, the pear industry, these all these things are they're all going to suffer eventually just because the price of the real estate. A developer is not going to sit there and say, hey, it's a noble thing to grow apples. No, he's going to put a building there or he's going to, you know, what I mean, it, it, the people population keeps growing. The alternate the the alternate sources in Central South America, Mexico, this is where it is. So. And I'll tell you, Asian vegetables, number one is probably Mexico now, number two, Honduras and Guatemala. So, Julio, the, these items that you want to extend, these items that you're talking about that you're, quote unquote, lobbying for with the Produce Association, uh, are these items going to replace existing products or are they going to ex extend existing menu uh, opportunities and options? What, what did, Where is this so, going to fit? Well, that's a good question. And thank you for asking it. But think yeah. about what did guacamole replace? What did avocados replace? Right? What did what were people eating on their cereals before we were slicing bananas on them? Um, I think what it is is, is you add it into your diet, right? You add it into your diet because it it cuts the monotony, right? It listen, I cook for my family. I've cooked for thirty five years uh, uh, that I've been married, and. I can tell you, it's not easy figuring out, especially when I had four people living in this house. I'm lucky that I know how to cook Asian and, and I've learned how to cook Spanish food and traditional. My mother-in-law taught me how to cook Italian. So it's important for us. But we sprinkle it in. I make it special. You know, my kids came over for my birthday and you ask them what they wanted. And let me tell you, my daughter and my son are both, you know, blonde and green eyes. And they, as American as apple pie, and they're like, Dad, can you make ropa vieja? Dad, can you make yuca? Dad, can you make? Because it's not something they get all the time. It's my daughter made me, gave me a blank recipe book and said, if you don't start writing down these recipes, I'm going to kill you. So <laughs> Christmas, I got a recipe book and I started writing down these recipes. Me, it's because, yes, it's my tradition. Cherry, it's your tradition, right? To eat your chicken adobo and to eat. But 
I think it's what makes America great, right? It's a melting pot. If an American family can walk in and the mom says, hey, we're going to have yucca fries today instead of French fries or tater tots. I think it just brings excitement into the kitchen, you know, and that, and that's what tropicals have done. Yeah. You yeah. know, there's a there's an entire Seinfeld episode about eating mangoes, you know, how, how you know, Kramer goes nuts because he's eating mangoes. And, and I truly believe that we are on the precipice of of getting, you know, the next mango, lychee, dragon fruit, um, rambutan. These types of things are going to get, we need to lobby, advocate so that they get more and more integrated into our everyday diet. So they are no longer tropical. They're no longer, you know, they just become another conventional produce item. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a great session. Um, we, Julio will be back next month uh, with another topic. Uh, we're going to be talking about the politics of produce. And uh, you'd be surprised. Uh, he gave you a little hint earlier on. But oh, and, and also, let, I just want to give give you a little background on how this came about. Um, you know, I said to Julio, we talked about the role of the migrant worker that's coming into the U.S. that's unable to get uh, working papers to be able to work. And he said to me, uh, it's really not a it's really we're at the wrong end of the problem. It shouldn't be happening when people arrive here. It should be happening in Honduras and Guatemala and El Salvador and the countries where the products are being raised. This could have been answered and could be answered. And his answer, which we will not get into now because you're going to have to tune in, was fascinating. Okay. Okay. Julio, why don't you give us one brief tidbit, something to take away along with everything else you've given us to take away, but one little thing to stick in everybody's mind. Well, whether whether you are a home cook or you are a chef or you run a hospitality group or a restaurant, I want you to check the alternative to certain things. You know, check and see. Go to Restaurant Depot, right? Great ad there for Restaurant Depot, huh, Fred? Go to Restaurant Depot and buy some yellow plantains already, already pre-cooked and try them. They're at Applebee's, guys, and they're at Chili's. Every day they're on the menu. Go have some yucca fries. Try it out. Um, give plantain chips a, a shot instead of frying tortillas. I think if you just integrate it, it could be, look, I have always thought that a restaurant is measured not by what it does on the weekend, but what it does on Tuesdays and Wednesdays and Thursdays, right? That's when your core, your favorite customers, your 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 allegiance, that's when they're there. So that's a great time to try it out. Say, hey, Bring out a bowl of yucca fries, make a garlic aioli and say, hey, why don't you guys try this instead of, you know, just, a, you know, some bread and butter. Uh, bring out some guacamole instead of with tortilla chips. Put plantains, the strips, the long one, they're beautiful. Put them in there and have them try it out. Give it as a special. Um, like I said, our items right now, they may seem foreign to a lot of people. It's people like me, hopefully, and other guys in the industry um, that are going to push these into the conventional, um, you know, into your conventional kitchen. And uh, again, thank you guys for showing up. Thank you, Larry and Fred, for the opportunity. And a quick little tidbit right after next month's show. And it's funny, I'm going right into the belly of the beast. I will be traveling to um, to Honduras and then from Honduras to Guanajuato, Mexico, uh, where we have a garlic uh, plantation and a new uh, plant, processing plant, that uh, I I don't think I'll be cutting the ribbon. It'll probably be like the governor or the mayor of that town, but I'm going right into the belly of the beast in Guanajuato, Mexico. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, great, great, great. So, Fred, say goodbye to everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. All right. And uh, although Julio will be back next next month, Fred and I will be back in two weeks. So check out uh, Eventbrite or check out your invitations directly from us for our topic and what we're going to do. And hey, I only have two more things to say. Everybody, stay positive, test negative. See you in two weeks. <laughs>